This is episode 261 of the Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts podcast. This episode is titled, Our Deadly Streets, with Jeff Speck. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts. I'm your host, Jennifer Crittenden. Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts is brought to you by Discreet Guide, the training company for improving your speaking and writing skills. Thank you for joining us and tune in on Mondays for new episodes. I'm delighted to welcome a new guest to the show today. Jeff Speck is with us. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Jennifer. Happy to be with you. Great. I'm going to introduce you. Jeff Speck is a city planner and author who advocates internationally for more walkable cities. His 2012 book, Walkable City, was the best-selling city planning title of the past decade and has been translated into eight languages, uh, which is really fun to see because they use different covers for those different languages. Yeah, it's really fun to see how other languages or cultures have interpreted what that means, walkable city. So very fun. I'm always, uh, I always love it when there's a new cover, right? Same book, new cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's one where, which shows like giant feet, like walking amongst these really tiny little cars. So that one was quite amusing. <laughs> the 10 year anniversary edition was published in November of 2022. And since 2007, he has led Spec and Associates, an award winning private design consultancy serving mainly American cities. He's the co-author of Suburban Nation, which the Wall Street Journal called the Urbanist's Bible, and the principal author of the Smart Growth Manual and Walkable City Rules. He has been named a fellow of both the American Institute of Certified Planners and the Congress for New Urbanism. And in a recent Planet Citizen... Planetism. Planetizen, there you go. Planetizen poll. He was voted one of the 10 most influential urbanists of all time. And his TED Talks and YouTube videos have been viewed more than 6 million times. We're so honored to have you with us, Jeff. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. And I should say, you mentioned Walkable City, which is the book most people read. Uh, if if after hearing this conversation, uh, anyone listening wants to read that book, which I sure hope, Um, make sure that they get the version with the green stripe down the cover that says 10th anniversary edition, because uh, I've added 100 more pages that basically covers the last decade and brings it up to date. Unfortunately, Amazon won't stop selling the old version, but I would uh, hope that you read the new one. Yeah, it's quite distinguishable now with that green stripe. It really stands out. I didn't realize that you'd added that many pages to it. I knew it had been updated, but that's great. I made a deal with my publisher to add a hundred to add fifty more pages, and then I started writing. Like, what do people need to know that's happened in the last ten years? And it ended up being more than a hundred. I cut it back to a hundred new pages. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot. You know, this whole topic keeps evolving, and in perhaps you know, sort of distressing ways. So, yeah, good to uh, update it and keep it on people's uh, minds. I wanted to start out by just talking about traffic engineering in general. And you wrote an op-ed for the, I mean, it's terrific how prolific you are because it's so easy to find all kinds of uh, articles and videos, uh, talks that you've done. You know, you, I really appreciate all the work you put into this uh, issue. But you wrote this op-ed for The Hill at the beginning of 2023 in which you talked about the mistake that American street designers so city engineers are building into our roads, into our infrastructures, essentially making them more conducive to speeding. Mm -hmm. And you said the persistence in this practice borders on criminal negligence. So can you tell us what's happening there? So American engineers have a, not uniquely, but certainly distinctly from European uh, engineers and uh, those in other developed nations, have a have a distinctly different approach to how to design the streets in our communities. And it's because the American uh, street design profession grew out of the American highway design profession. Mm-hmm. And so we have an approach here that's the opposite of what they do in Europe with Vision Zero. 
Vision Zero, which is you know the goal of achieving zero traffic deaths in your city uh, in any given year or forever, um, which some cities like Oslo and Helsinki have actually accomplished, is a uh, strategy where you determine what speed you want the vehicles to be going in a given environment. And then you design the environment to ensure that drivers aren't very comfortable driving above that speed. So you have narrower lanes and tighter spaces and something as simple as removing the center line from a street actually causes people to drive seven miles an hour slower. Well, that's an interesting, we could do that. <laughs> and by the way, in the federal government's guide, the MUTCD, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices Guide, uh, if you want a federally funded street, you've got to put a center line down the middle of it. So, I mean, there's all this, uh, I'm, I'm interrupting myself with, with specific bizarre examples that proliferate throughout our system. But the vision zero technique that has only begun to, uh, you know, wash up on our shores is to recognize that the speed that drivers go is a function of the environment. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, what, what does highway engineering teach us? Well, on a highway, people set their speeds based on the speed limit. Like if you're, if you're me, you look for the speed limit, you set your cruise control for nine miles an hour over the speed limit, and that's the speed that you go, right? And everyone has their own tolerance, but because speed is a function of speed limit, anything you can do to remove potential for conflict, to, to increase elbow room, to add forgiveness, that's a word that the engineers use. In a highway environment, anything that you can do to add forgiveness is going to make the street safer because the speed is a constant. So wider lanes no opposing traffic, no parallel parking, no trees. They're called FHOs, fixed hazardous objects. <laughs> That's sad. No intersections, swooping long curves as opposed to tighter curves. Um, uh, you know, no uh, vertical displacement like humps and other things. Those sort of things do make a highway safer. Unfortunately, they were brought into the design of our city streets. And the same engineers who learned to make a street safer by removing potential for conflict, then created city streets in America, which became the standard, which have a ton of elbow room and therefore encourage speeding. And the typical American street is engineered for speeds way above the speed limit that you're allowed to post on it. And in fact, I was working in a community in uh, outside of Birmingham, Alabama, one of one of many instances where this occurred, where we wanted people to drive 20 miles an hour. Uh, we were told we had to we couldn't have a speed limit less than 20 miles an hour. And then we were told that meant we had to engineer it for 30 miles an hour, right? So this is the sort of approach that's standard in the U.S. The point of my article in The Hill was to address the fact that the Department of Transportation was spending a tremendous amount of money on grants to make places safer. And yet every day we're building more and more streets that are dangerous without changing the rules that are causing that to happen. Yeah, your description of those streets reminds me. I mean, that's exactly the image that I have of our suburban streets here in San Diego. You know, very wide avenues, very wide lanes, you know, and people just go uh, astonishing speeds on them. <laughs> and there are, you know, there are stoplights and crosswalks, but when I travel on those streets. I'm always joking with my husband. I, I go out and make every driver sign a contract before I pass in front of them because I don't trust them to not run over me. I mean, yeah. you know, they are very hazardous to pedestrians. You know, there's a wonderful documentary that you may know of that came out called The Street Project. Mm -mm. It's only about a year old. Uh, if you Google The Street Project, you can find your way to their website. And if you Google Street Project on U YouTube, you can actually watch the whole movie today for free. Oh. And it's a wonderful discussion. I help them with it, and I'm in it quite a bit. But the uh, the story it tells of different streets in different places, and particularly in Phoenix, which was developed around the same time as San Diego, it tells the story of a whole bunch of streets in which you know, people are dropping like flies because they were engineered like highways in environments where people are actually walking and biking. A lot of a lot of the times because they have no choice. It's been a great tool to raise awareness in communities around street safety, and I, I really recommend it, the Street Project. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. So quick aside here, what is the deal about the rolled curbs? Why do we have those? 
rolled that's that's a really good question rolled curbs i think they're certainly cheaper oh they're uh less damaging to vehicles that run up against them they probably last longer than angled curbs because there's no sharp bends in them right oh. but i suppose i should know where they came from i can tell i can tell you that we always advocate for vertical curbs and not rolled curbs uh clearly as i think you're thinking walking on a sidewalk against a rolled curb does not feel like a a safe spot no it doesn't they're probably intended to limit damage if a semi turning a corner runs over it oh right so they're mountable sometimes in certain conditions jennifer i will specify a rolled curb if i'm creating a corner that is so tight mm-hmm. an environment that is so pinched that uh trucks are going to mount it mm-hmm. for example when we do a roundabout and i'm not a big roundabout fan because they're they're not particularly walkable they're very safe but they don't feel all that walkable mm-hmm. but when i do a roundabout uh you know i'll do a center island that is is too big for the trucks to get around it and i'll put a roll curb on it knowing that right. the trucks will mount it and the cars will not for example in that situation that certainly makes sense well let's do some statistics just to uh, get uh, some quantification of what we're talking about here so pedestrian deaths in the united states in 2022 was about 7500 which was a 40 year high and that's not an anomaly the uh, traffic deaths have been, pedestrian deaths have been going up, well, and probably total traffic deaths too for the last decade. That actually, pedestrian deaths, that's up 80% since 2009. Yeah, I think 82%. So if you feel as though you're more under siege walking around than you were a few decades ago, that is correct. Your impression is correct. And by the way, deaths inside vehicles have been fairly steady uh, over the years or even declining. The exception was COVID. Here's something funny. People thought that the increase in deaths of drivers during COVID, because there was a big uptick in vehicle deaths, pedestrian and otherwise during COVID, people assumed that it was because somehow the population was crazy, right? Uh, right. I had to hear that. Oh, everyone's so stressed. Yeah. Yeah. And like, <laughs> ah, COVID. And they punched the accelerator and let go of the wheel. Uh, in fact, what has become well established and little known is if something can be both those things is that it was due entirely to reduce congestion due to less driving speeding so there were there were fewer drivers there were more opportunities to speed so there were more traffic death and that's it was interesting i mean there are a lot of things that were horrible about that experience but it's interesting when something so profound shifts and then you get to see what the impact of that was so yeah if we ever were questioning if speed is the driving force behind pedestrian deaths. I think we have the answer now. Yeah. Which really makes the work that you're doing, I think, you know, even more relevant, right? It's pretty clear that's that's where you need to focus. I was trained as an architect. I thought I was going to be an architect. I became a city planner, and now I spend most of my time on streets, just like getting the lanes the right width and making circumstances where I hope fewer people will die because obviously saving lives is a nice thing to do, but also because most cities want to become more walkable and the way to make them more walkable the quickest is to make them safer. Mm -hmm. And if you've read my stuff, you know that I describe the useful, I, I describe the choice to walk. It's what I call my general theory of walkability in which I say, how do you create a circumstance in which people are going to make the choice to walk? And the answer is that the walk has to be as good as the drive. And to do that, it needs to do four things simultaneously. The walk needs to be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. And each one of those categories lays out a set of opportunities and responsibilities that we can take on to achieve them. But the useful walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk are principally a function of what surrounds the streets, Mm -hmm. right? Meanwhile, the safe walk is principally a function of the streets themselves. The things that surround the streets change only slowly, and government only has a limited role in changing them. Governments can change their zoning, which is very important. They can increase, you know, opportunities for housing, for example, in downtown, super important. They can use their own or other people's money to incentivize the right sorts of development. But it's principally private property that surrounds streets, making those streets useful, comfortable, and interesting. 
And therefore, it's only a second order impact when the government makes a change. But the cities own their streets, towns own their streets. There are exceptions, of course, counties own some roads, and unfortunately, DOTs, Department, State Departments of Transportation, own some really important roads. And depending on what state you're in, uh, it could be just a few or none or all of the streets in your downtown are owned by a state or a county. But for the most part, most communities own most of their streets. And in short order, by not even rebuilding the streets, simply by restriping the streets, mm -hmm. by laying down a new top coat of asphalt and repainting the striping, uh, and sometimes you don't even need that new top coat, you can fundamentally change the way that your city is used by vehicles and therefore how safe it is for pedestrians. And we do a number of things almost everywhere we go. One of the things we do is get rid of multi-lane one-way streets, which a ton of American cities have. San Diego. Multi-lane one-way streets are super unsafe because of that opportunity to jockey from lane to lane and the lack of opposing traffic and just the behavior that drivers take on in multi-lane streets. So all over the place, we've turned multi-lane one-ways back to two-way. Secondly, we often are removing signals from intersections and putting in all-way stop signs. And when you remove a signal from an intersection and replace it with an always stop sign, according to a study, when 400 lights were eliminated in Philadelphia and subsequent studies, you reduce severe pedestrian injuries by about uh, two thirds. That's just amazing. Yeah. And by the way, when you replace a multi-lane one-way system, which many American downtowns have with two-lane two-ways, that gives you the opportunity, which you didn't have before, to get rid of signals. So those two things together are often the biggest impact that we have in, in communities, um, and they really transform the communities overnight. I, I have testimony after testimony or testimonial from cities where they were unsafe before the change, and now they're safe after the change. Yeah, what's also interesting to me about that is it's not nearly as expensive as you might think, right? No. People might think, oh, we have to redesign the whole downtown, but not really. Well, and signals are signals are expensive and they need to be replaced periodically. If you can get rid of signals, you're actually saving money in a city. And those two things are counterintuitive, I think, to a lot of Americans. I think I've assumed one way streets were safer because you only have to look one way. Right. And maybe less turning and all that. There's nothing wrong with one lane one ways, but two lane one ways and up are the problem. But I've had people I've had people in meetings say to me, wow, I only have to look one way on this one way. I don't want to have to look both ways. It's safer the way it is. And I say, you're welcome to have that opinion. However, let's look at the statistics. Exactly. And you, just, you know, you got to be driven by the data and the data make it very clear that uh, that that's that's an, a false uh, imagination. The other one, too, that I think is counterintuitive for people, because I, I hear my neighbors talk about this, this issue of, of traffic light versus stop sign, is that they think a traffic light is safer. Do you have any opinion about why our instincts are so incorrect about this? Well, I tell you, there's, there is one community that's actually divided on it, and that's the, the, uh, the blind community, where I was informed by a blind neighbor um, who's very active in this space that about half of the people he talks to really prefer a signal, signalized intersection because they have the chirp, right? Yeah. They have the beep of the chirp that tells them when to go. But the other half, and they tend to be the, the the more old school folks, and also people who've been blind their whole lives and not more recently, they understand that they're much safer, in a, even though they have less confidence in an intersection in which they can't hear when to cross, they do understand that they're safer in an always stop intersection because uh, people are just so much more aware. Yeah. The fundamental thing that distinguishes an always stop from an intersection is that no one except the most flagrant scofflaw is going to go through an always stop at any significant speed. Yeah. Whereas half the people going through a signalized intersection are going quite fast. They're just waiting for that green light that tells them they can speed through or the yellow light that tells them to speed up. Right. So you have a fundamentally calmer and more communicative circumstance. There's a lot of eye contact. Generally, pedestrians are waved through. Bicyclists just blow through. And mostly that's not a problem. Right. <laughs> everyone's looking at everyone else and no one's going very fast. And that's what that's what really counts. Somewhere in one of your articles, you mentioned 
being struck at a car that's traveling at 30 miles per hour versus one that's traveling at 20 miles per hour. So that 10 speed per hour differential resulted in someone's likelihood of dying by like seven to nine times more likely. Yeah. That I, yeah. uh, that shocked me. And my gosh, I mean, when people blow through stoplights here in San Diego, that they might be going, you know, 50 or 60 yeah. miles per hour. Yeah. It's actually, it's a geometric, you know, relationship. So every single mile of a mile per hour that you can get cars to go slower, you're increasing safety dramatically. You mentioned too, and I think this is such an interesting observation that perhaps one of the reasons people don't like stop signs, four-way stops especially, is because they have to negotiate with the other drivers, which you do, right? You have to yeah. look them in the eye. You have to figure out who's going to go first, wave people through. Oh, no, you, you know, all the jokes about Californians, yeah, waving each other through until they hit each other in the middle of the intersection. But I thought that was such a fascinating observation that people, they would prefer not to have that kind of complexity, right? But it does it does make, make you part of the community, right? It's it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, and you Californians are you're such courteous drivers normally, so uh, that could be a good thing. No, it's true. Yeah, it's true. I want to go back to Europe, though, because this is what really astonishes me, is the traffic deaths, pedestrian deaths in the United States just getting worse and worse. And yet Europe is making such incredible improvements in their death rate. Uh, you mentioned the Vision Zero program, but also you documented that in Holland, they started this, what we would uh, translate to in English as the Stop Child Murder yeah. program so that, so that children are not killed on our streets, which you'd think that would be of extreme importance to our society. So they actually reduced the number of children who were killed from 500 in 1971 to nine in 2014, which is just astonishing. So yeah. so tell us about how they've been so successful. Well, it was a mother-led Stop Der Kindermord uh, protest movement that for one reason or another impacted the profession of street design more than anything in the U.S. has, right? And in the U.S., we're always quick to blame the driver. And of course, we have Mothers Against Drunk Driving and other successful movements, but they don't deal with the fact that every crash is a function of two things, you know, the performance of the driver, but also the environment of the driving. Yeah. In, in Holland in particular, they've gone beyond what I'm suggesting, and they're actually tearing out the stop signs. So they went from signals to stop signs, and now they're going from stop signs to naked, what they call naked streets. The understanding now is if you're driving through, a particularly through a residential or, or kind of urban uh, community, that when you get to an intersection, your first job is to make sure no one else is coming. And you don't need a stop sign to tell you to stop. You just, everyone yields to, to everyone else in response to the circumstances. Now, of course, in the bigger multi-lane, you know, urban locations in downtown Amsterdam or Utrecht or wherever, Rotterdam, they have they have signals. But in more quiet or lower density environments, the, the streets are entirely naked. And the Naked Streets movement was started, I believe, in the 70s by a fellow named Hans Mondermann, who died around 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And he would famously create these, you know, these intersections, major intersections in cities. And then he would get on camera and slowly walk backwards into them <laughs> and, and and you'd watch the the sea of traffic part around him like a sort of performance art yeah and he would always say you know most people when they see a problem they say let's add a sign when i see a problem i say let's take a sign away nice <laughs> i like it yeah I wanted to mention too, because again, you know, that's something that's not very expensive to do. Some of the uh, streets near my house have been uh, restriped to include now a bike lane. So they mm -hmm. haven't, you know, they haven't expanded the roadbed, but they have given the space to the cars, a smaller space to allow room for a bike lane. And we've been living here for 20 some years. My husband 
has said very often that he, not very often, but occasionally he would get honked at when he would take the lane uh, under a certain uh, underpass that's near our house. He said since they've done that, he's not been honked at at all. I thought that was so interesting that just striping the road, changing the stripes really did drive, a, I think, a different attitude on the part of the driver about the bike. Well, I think drivers hate to see bike lanes go in because they feel that you're taking something away from them. And in some cases, you are actually removing traffic lanes for bike lanes. I mean, that does happen. Um, in many cases, though, in the places I work, there are opportunities to, because lanes are so wide, yeah, and there's extra room in streets. There's opportunities to create bike lanes kind of out of thin air. Yeah. I would say that when we do uh, what I call a walkability study, which is any of these efforts to make downtown safer that I work on, we need to back them up with traffic studies. Uh, it, it's very few cities. Boston's one of them. But it's very few cities that are willing to step forward and say, no, you know, we're a multimodal city. We understand that driving is the worst for the environment, the worst for the economy. It sends most of the money out of our local economy, that people who bike and walk are contributing more to the local economy and, of course, the local society than people who are just plowing through it in cars. Um, we have good alternatives in terms of transit and walking and biking. And therefore, we're actually going to, in certain locations where the sociability of the street space is really important. We're we're actually willing to reduce the quote unquote throughput of vehicles, but that's a very rare city. Most cities I work in say no. You know you can't make downtown congestion worse. So what do we do? Well, we do a traffic study and we identify those streets that are underutilized and those streets that are overutilized, and kind of a, a first order of intervention is to remove lanes from those streets that have more lanes than they need. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Oklahoma City, we were able to remove about a third of the lanes. Wow. Because they were they were sized for a lot more traffic that they didn't have. And we actually were able to double the amount of on-street parking. Oh, nice. Which merchants really appreciated. There was no bike network. We created a bike network. And we knew that we weren't going to impact traffic because we were using the streets that had low traffic on them. Now, there's a second order of intervention, which is a little more intelligent, which acknowledges that the street network is a network and people can make the choice to go where there's less congestion. And in fact, they will. And in fact, now with ways enabled Google Maps, they do. So you can always count now in a city on people distributing their trips efficiently because Waze is kind of doing it for them. Right. And it doesn't matter whether you're on Waze or not. Someone else is. Mm -hmm. And they're distributing themselves that way. And so in that circumstance, you don't have to just look street by street. You look systematically. Yeah. And you say, oh, you know, this one street is kind of overrun by traffic. And theoretically, we can't reduce the number of lanes. But guess what? It's the main street. It's the only chance this community has at having a social center. And we'd rather see people on parallel streets going fast, not on the street. A wonderful example is Lancaster Boulevard, which is the heart of Lancaster, California. Oh, yeah. Which was a five-lane highway getting 18,000 cars per day. And it was dead. And the community was dead. And they turned it into a two-lane road mm -hmm. with beautiful trees and plaza in the center that they use for parking when they're not using it for farmer's markets or other things. Basically turned it into a linear parking plaza. Mm -hmm. And they reduced the number of cars per day from 18,000 to 12,000, understanding that there were other ways to get through. Yeah. And the whole community has completely come back. Yeah. So this was an $11 million investment that the city made. It generated, I think, $300 million in business activity and completely transformed Lancaster into a place where people didn't want to be to a, a center, a, a real a regional center for commerce and uh, pleasure. <laughs> uh, it just shows that you shouldn't, you know, feel that you need to be a slave to traffic counts. You can redistribute traffic, move it around. Then there's a final third order way of thinking, which is simply a fact, which is that the amount of traffic we actually have in our streets in congested systems is an equilibrium that exists because people are willing to put up with it. Yep. And what you find is when you change the number of lanes in a system, either increasing them and getting more trips or reducing the number of lanes and getting fewer trips is that congestion stays pretty much the same. People adjust their behavior. 
there's no Carmageddon where when you lose a lane or two, all of a sudden everyone's in gridlock. People change their behavior, often somewhat painlessly. There's a wonderful article I read about the sea, the Alaska way in Seattle. I believe it was in, it was in Streets blog, but the title was Carmageddon Never Comes. Mm -hmm. And the, that was the experience when they removed the highway, Alaska way viaduct running through Seattle. Everyone said it would be a complete gridlock. Didn't happen. When they replaced the Embarcadero elevated freeway and central freeways in San Francisco due, due to the Loma Prieta earthquake that happened in the 80s, mm -hmm. Um, everyone predicted Carmageddon didn't happen because these systems are in equilibrium that's driven by the principal cost of driving. And that cost is time, not not gas. It's time. Right. The only way that we're really made to pay for our driving lives, which is subsidized about 10 to 1 by externalities, general tax revenues, and of course, the costs of accidents and hospital and everything else that grows out of using roads. For every dollar you spend driving, one study showed that other people and you through your general taxation are paying about $10 more. Wow. So because driving is so heavily subsidized, the smart thing to do if you own a car is to drive it all the time. Right. In those in those circumstances, <laughs> you're practically making money. <laughs> yeah. Every mile you drive costs less than the mile before it. And of course, uh, actually, about four fifths of the cost of driving are fixed and only about one four, one fifth are variable. Mm -hmm. the, the costs that change with every mile are a, a minor portion of the cost you pay. So the smart thing to do is to drive your car as much as possible. And in, in those circumstances, which is what economists refer to as a free good a good that you vastly underpay for. Mm -hmm. The typical way you pay for it is through congestion, which is why congestion pricing is the one way to eliminate congestion in a network. It's the only way. By having large tolls that cause the cost of driving to mirror the value of driving, then you end up with people making rational choices about when to drive and when not to drive. But in the absence of congestion pricing, which is now being implemented in New York City, for the first time after a 20 year struggle, and who knows if it will be implemented anywhere else after great success in Singapore and Stockholm and London and other places, unless you implement congestion pricing, then your congestion is going to be a constant. But the question is how many lanes of congestion do you want? Yeah, I wanna not forget to comment on this because I think you've written that again, contrary to what we might think, Traffic actually moves faster through a city if it is governed by stop signs than by stoplights. And again, I think that's really counterintuitive to Californians. Well, this is back to the stoplight conversation. The other thing I was going to mention is that some resistance to stop signs comes from people feeling that it will slow them down to have stop signs. And the fact is that when you replace signals with stop signs, you actually get through the downtown faster. Because although you're stopping a lot, you're never sitting and waiting at a light. Now, the one exception to that, of course, is the green wave on one-way streets. And if your, goal is to have a, if your goal is to have a downtown, which people blow through and never stop in, you know, if you want to be a place for driving through and not arriving at, then by all means, have a green wave one-way system. But that just shows that, you know, the priorities aren't around making a, a destination, uh, but just a conduit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's switch to talking about strodes. What are strodes? Well, strode is a term coined by Chuck Marone, who's the founder of the very, very important Strong Towns movement. If you look at strongtowns.org, you'll see what they're up to. But I should say Chuck is also the former traffic engineer who, in his book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, uh, has the best discussion, perhaps equal to mine, <laughs> <laughs> wow, right find, up there. <laughs> that you can find on why eliminating signals for stop signs actually makes the downtown more efficient. But Chuck coined the term strode to describe a certain kind of thoroughfare that we find in many of our communities. In California. That are neither properly streets nor roads. He defines a road as a street designed to get people from place to place, more like a highway. And he defines a street as a community thoroughfare that's more about the generation of wealth and community than it is about moving vehicles. And, uh, you know, the classic street is a old hometown main street or an old residential, you know, neighborhood street. 
the classic road is a highway. And the classic road, there's really two types. There's the Route 66 type or the Boston Post Road type here on the East Coast, which is a highway that's been allowed to collect a accretion of detritus <laughs> all around it. Wow. Shops and gas stations and Casey's and, uh, you know, curb cuts everywhere. And basically it's a highway whose principal function of moving vehicles has been crippled by the fact that it's become a place of commerce which it doesn't serve all that well because of course you'll you have to drive from one parking lot to the next to get from one store to the next the other type of road is the old main street that's been been turned into a highway by the traffic engineers yeah so a lot of cities typical cities in america like davenport iowa they took their road system and they made them multi-lane one ways and now you have cars speeding through what should be a street with low speed traffic on it a strode Chuck likens to a futon, which is a sofa that's also a bed, but does both jobs poorly. <laughs> and that's that's what a that's what a strode is also. And so many of the deaths on American streets are occurring in strodes because people are trying to walk on them, trying to bike on them, and they're just inviting high speeds that don't welcome that. In addition, you know, like US one or Route 66, you have high you have high speeds and you have people pulling in and pulling out all the time. Mm -hmm. So even for the drivers, it's a much more dangerous environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a quote that you have in there about the key is convincing the local automotive hordes that one small part of their city deserves to be a street and not a road. And so the follow on to that, you know, if you want to blow through downtown, leave the street and take go a different the way. Road. Yeah, go a different way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, you know, this question plays itself out, I think, all over the place in San Diego, where people are trying to avoid a traffic jam on a freeway. And so they attempt to blow through a downtown. And until fairly recently, you know, that was considered acceptable behavior. So I think it's interesting to see that that's shifting now. These little, these uh, small urban areas are objecting to that, right? They don't want to be the bypass, so to speak. Right. I don't want to leave this behind. I want to mention one more very ironic thing about uh, Vision Zero. So can you tell us what happened in Atlanta? It's unfortunate. You know, I'm I'm about to do some work in Chattanooga, but the it was actually in Chattanooga, not Atlanta, but Atlanta's, Atlanta's Vision Zero manager was killed in a crosswalk in Chattanooga. And um, you can't write this stuff. No, right? I mean, it's just life is strange. Life is stranger than fiction. I know that my own experience. I don't know what that person was doing, but I'm willing to guess they were researching the street they were hit on. Mm -hmm. I'm always walking around downtowns, and I have to say, I'm very careful. Uh, I've had a few close calls, but I had a a, a shocking close call. You know, the one of the worst cities, maybe the worst city for traffic in America is Orlando. Oh. In New York City, in Portland, in San Francisco, about three to four people per 100,000 people uh, die per year in car crashes. In Dallas, it's about 12 per 100,000. Wow. In Orlando, it's 18. Wow. And there's a number of reasons for this. I think four out of the five worst in the country are in Florida. That You mentioned that. There's two factors. The cities are newer, so they're designed according to modern transportation engineering as opposed to you know the cow paths of yore. But also, um, Florida has a glitch where a lot of the streets are state-owned. I and see. And so it's the state engineers who design the state engine, the state officials who are presiding over them, and a state DOT that you know, has been beat up for 20 years over being the most dangerous state in the country and yet has only made minor concessions to what it means to make roads safe. In Orlando, I was right downtown, a block south of City Hall, and I was leading a group of eight planners and officials, and we were waiting at a corner to cross going south. And the crosswalk flashed the walk sign, and I announced walking man and i stepped into the street as a car going south probably 30 miles an hour turned the corner yeah. in into my path and i was pulled back 
I wasn't hit, but that's the only instance I've had in my life where I actually, you know, I, I still have a bit, a little bit of PTSD. Yeah. And it's just amazing. You're working in a town and you're trying to calm their traffic because they're one of the worst in the country. And uh, you get firsthand experience of a condition of like, there were three lanes heading south and there were two lanes heading west, which was the right-hand turn. And uh, the pedestrian was given the crosswalk at a not inappropriate time, but cars that are turning right as they're going straight are supposed to yield to pedestrians and crosswalks. And when you have a street system that looks like a highway that encourages yeah. highway speeds on the way to and the way from the highway that runs right through downtown, you end up with circumstances where that sort of thing is happening all the time. Yeah. No, a very common occurrence here, yeah. especially around this area of San Diego where the traffic lights are very long because yeah. they have they, you know, have to accommodate all the left turners, you know, all the yeah. Yeah, all the different lanes. And then so people the driver's head is turned, right? Because yeah. they're looking for they're yeah. they're worried about oncoming cars. They're not worried about running over a pedestrian. Well, we could we could tell these uh, traffic horror stories all day. I'm working in suburban Salt Lake City and I found in places like Lehigh, L E H I, Utah, I won't cross at the intersections. You know, this is a this it's a six or eight lane road and I'll get mid block and I'll wait till there's a gap in the traffic and I'll run because the intersections just aren't safe. Yeah. There's it's too complicated. Even with the signal. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So um there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Well, one thing is I you know, it's so interesting to me that Americans have become kind of immune to traffic deaths. Do you have any speculation about why? No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're not even, they're hardly even reported in the news here, right? Yeah. I, I can't say why, but what I can say is that we take them for granted. Yeah. There's just an assumption that it's part of being an American. And there's an ignorance around the fact that different countries are so much safer or more dangerous than each other. And that different cities in the U.S. are so much safer or more dangerous than each other. Even more, more to the point, different parts of every city, right? Most, most downtowns are safer than most suburban zones. And in fact, yeah. the inner city is safer than the leafy white collar suburbs. One um, researcher did a study and found, I think it was Alan Durning. He compared San Francisco and Vancouver, so he got Canadian, and I believe Seattle. And he looked at the combined deaths from car crashes and murder by strangers because murder by your spouse, you know, is, is, uh, independent of location. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Adding up murder by strangers and car crashes. He found that in all three of those cities, you were much safer in the inner inner city in the slums than you were in the leafy, you know, country club suburbs. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about that because you've done some really interesting work on trees. Uh, so, yeah, so speaking of leafy, uh, what have you found out about that? Well, um, I've always been a tree hugger, I suppose. I love beautiful trees and big trees, but I've never had much interface with trees except specifying them in my street plans and, of course, insisting that any street I ever design is lined continuously by trees, which is what all good designers do. Uh, most designers aren't good and most cities don't require it. But a smart city will require continuous trees along any newly built street because trees generally pay for themselves about 12 to one in terms of the investment that you make in planting them and keeping them alive for a year, which is about $450 per tree. And the benefits which then accrue which include, and I don't have my uh, Relief Cedar Rapids plan in front of me, but I would direct through your show notes, I would direct your, your listeners to a plan called Relief Cedar Rapids, uh, which is a city that lost two thirds of its canopy and actually about 670,000 trees in one hour during a windstorm in 2020. Yeah, insane. And I was hired with a great team from Confluence Landscape to create a new plan for them to get all their trees back. And what I learned, I knew some of this already, but I learned and, and got the data on the fact that 
in addition to being lovely and protecting the sidewalk from moving vehicles, trees do these things. They absorb a ton of stormwater, so you can actually reduce your stormwater budget considerably. Oh, how interesting. They preserve the pavement that's under them, and you can repave your street much less frequently oh. if you have a tree on it. They result in fewer car crashes and fewer injuries because people drive more slowly uh, when there are trees around. They absorb more CO2 than just about anything in the uh, urban environment. They eliminate or reduce vastly urban heat islands. Of course, they reduce climate change in many different ways. Uh, native trees are necessary to maintain the food web that we have in, in our environment. And we're, of course, we're, we're now in, in, experiencing the sixth mass extinction in global history and it's caused by humans and uh one thing we can do to stem it is to have more food for animals and that's the role that native trees play they reduce the costs of heating your home in the winter they reduce the cost of cooling your home in the summer they cause higher performance uh higher academic performance just counting the number of trees in a schoolyard these are longitudinal studies just counting the number of trees in a schoolyard determines to some degree how well the students do. Also, longitudinal studies show that adding trees or removing trees has a direct impact on crime in communities. They increase property value to such an extent that cities can tax a little bit more that pays for the maintenance of the trees mm. again, times over. They increase revenues to businesses near them, et cetera, et cetera. There are a dozen ways that trees pay for themselves a dozen times over <clears throat> and they're the most undervalued aspect of our urban landscape. So I'm a huge tree fan. Well, I really appreciate the time you've spent with us. And before I let you go, is there anything that you'd like to uh, advise our listeners to do or to visit or to buy your book or whatever you think they need to know? Well, I would love for people to, I, I would say if, if you're just, if you're a general reader who enjoys learning stuff, I would recommend Walkable City to you. If you want a book to convince others of these issues, Walkable City, if you want one to distribute to your city council or uh, planning commission, that's the book. If you're doing the work, if you're a practitioner or an activist who actually uh, is in the field making change, I would recommend the book Walkable City Rules, mm -hmm. which is much more technical, has a lot of pictures, diagrams, charts, and um, that's a slightly bigger, slightly more expensive book, still not expensive. And then... Um, I uh, can be found at jeffspeck.com is my website. And I also go to places and give lectures. So if there's an interest. I gave, a, I gave a lecture recently in New Hampshire that was entirely crowdfunded. Oh. So they didn't have any money and they brought me in anyway because they just got everyone to chip in. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, California is far, but uh, I, you know, I like to travel and spread the gospel. So that's my story and I'm glad you're uh, sharing it. Yeah, thank you so much for, well, especially for the work that you do, Jeff, but also for coming on the show. Uh, my pleasure. And Jennifer, keep doing what you do as well. Thank you for listening. Our goal in 2024 is to expand our audience because we get such great guests. So we'd love your help in spreading the word by sharing, subscribing, liking, thumbs upping, rating, and commenting. Got all that? Really, thanks for any support. Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts is brought to you by Discreet Guy, the training company for improving your speaking and writing skills. Also, a shout out to Podomatic, our podcast hosting platform. You podcasters out there might want to check them out. They've been good to us. And finally, thanks to Quincas Morera for the theme music. Music.